What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Aaron Nix. This is the WrestleBlog YouTube channel, and it's time to review WWE Raw, just two weeks away from Survivor Series. War Games! It's War Games! WWE Raw has made it very clear that the United States title is, of course, the title on Raw. It's their equivalent of the World Heavyweight Championship or the undisputed WWE Universal Championship that Roman Reigns is carrying around. That's why Seth Rollins opened and closed the show, as he seems to be doing more and more. He comes out. No idea where he's getting a suit. Love the glasses, by the way. No, I'm not wearing these glasses as new glasses because Seth Rollins was wearing new shades, by the way. I've had these glasses for a while. I actually broke the other ones. Speaking of things that got broken, Mustafa Ali once again thinks that he is allowed to get in the way of Bobby Lashley, who would come out to basically say, yo, until I get my United States title opportunity again, I'm going to continue to kill everything, and especially you, Seth Rollins. Mustafa Ali jumps in again, he gets yeeted over the table again, and then we have a match. They're desperately trying to build Mustafa Ali as this likable baby face, you know? He's, oh, he's a plucky underdog, and you need to get behind him. But ultimately, the crowds don't give a fucking shit. And that is sad, because I've campaigned for a long time from Mustafa Ali to be a bigger deal on the company's roster, and especially with my Middle Eastern heritage. I want to see someone like him representing well, and I feel like he's got all the tools, but it just isn't working. The fans just don't relate to him, and ultimately, they were enjoying Bobby Lashley beating the shit out of him, chanting one more time every time he was laying him out, and it's Bobby Lashley who ultimately picks up the win, albeit after a plucky effort from Mustafa Ali. A lot of this show involved posturing about who was going to be on whose War Games team backstage. We see that Mia Yim's with the OC and she's talking about how I'm going to take care of business. And then she has a singles match with Tamina. What do you do? Mia Yim picks up the win over Tamina. Frankly, a very dull and uninteresting match. Mia Yim, who's only been here for two or three weeks, already kind of feels a bit boring, a bit dull. Not really her fault. They're just not giving us anything other than the fact that she is... A dangerous woman. That's kind of all the gimmick we've got for her, other than the fact she's aligned with the OC. And the OC are trying their hardest backstage with these funny vignettes. But again, it's another person like Mustafa Ali who's got all the tools, but nobody seems to care. One of the sleeper hits of the night was Chad Gable versus Matt Riddle. This is a really good match, and it's really nice that Alpha Academy finally, despite still being hilarious, by the way, and we're getting more funny Otis, which I love because Otis, when he's being comedic, is brilliant. Um, they picked up the win. And it feels like they're being taken more seriously as a tag team. Obviously, Gable gets the win because Otis holds down Riddle's feet. But that's neither here nor there. The fact that they actually picked up a big win over somebody who's considered one of the mainstays of Raw, one of the people who's carried the product for so long, is quite cool for me. And the match itself was really good as well, especially the German off the top rope, where Riddle landed badly on his hip. Oh, oh. Sometimes it's better to take the front bump, buddy. For some reason, we insist on this annoying continuance of this terrible Miz, Gargano, and Dexter Loomis triangle angle. It's not good at all. The Miz comes down dressed as Mr. Rogers, which thankfully they did actually mention on the mic. He does a Miz TV where he's not the host, and then he just berates Byron Saxton, which is fine, because Byron Saxton absolutely fucking sucks balls. Johnny Gargano comes down, calls him a liar, and they essentially build to the fact that it's going to be the Miz versus Dexter Loomis, and if... The Miz wins, then Dexter Loomis can fuck off forever, I guess. But if Dexter Loomis wins, the Miz has to pay him the money he's owed. And also Dexter Loomis gets a contract. This will happen at Survivor Series War Games. This should happen at Survivor Series War Games pre-show because nobody fucking cares. And of course, Dexter Loomis is hiding behind him as the camera operator. Good stuff. It's getting boring now. He does this every week. Find something different for the guy to do other than just stalk people because honestly, nobody cares. He needs something more in depth or he needs to be a part of something like the way in NXT where people felt like they could be more excited and more involved in what he was doing because there were so many other moving parts that were entertaining you. Dana Brooke is sad that the 24-7 title was put in the bin. You're the only one, love. He faces EO Sky of Damage Control, looking for retribution for the way she's been treated by Damage Control. Okay, great. EO Sky picks up the win in a half-decent affair, but the bottom line is that no one really cares about Dana Brooke, which is a shame because she's beautiful and she's lovely and she's talented and she looks the part. But again, this is booking. They have no idea what to do with her. She's just the plucky little underdog who floats around. She's very much the female Mustafa Ali in a lot of ways in the way she's booked. And it's just not being received well by the audience. Easily the highlight of the night, if you're a wrestling fan, is Austin Theory versus Dolph Ziggler. We saw this amazing backstage promo earlier in the night. To be honest, Austin Theory was definitely the highlight of this show, at least for my money. Um, he was backstage, he was talking about how 
as the money in the bank holder, it was almost like an albatross around his neck. And all the time he tried to cash in, he was always thwarted it because there's always going to be somebody around Roman Reigns or there's always going to be someone interrupting, which is why he thought it would be sensible to cash in on a United States title. It was actually a really good explanation as to why he cashed in on a mid-card title, so to speak, even though it's being elevated to a world title level on Raw all the while that there is no world title on Raw. He's interrupted by Ziggler. Ziggler calls him a kid. This weighs on Austin Fury, and Austin Fury says, tell you what, how about you wrestle me tonight? And he goes, okay, kid. And that leads to their match, which, to be fair, was fucking awesome. If this had been a main event on a pay-per-view, people like Meltzer and everyone else would have been losing their minds, because it's smack dab in the middle of Raw. It's probably going to be forgotten about very, very quickly, but it's genuinely the match you need to go out of your way to see. Great storytelling, great psychology, two wrestlers selling their asses off. And of course, it builds and builds and builds to Fury snapping more and more. He could beat Ziggler. He decides instead to just beat the everlasting shit out of him. Just keeps battering him, throwing things on him, throwing him into the Simon Gibbs area. Matt gets thrown out and uh, Fury just kind of skulks off enraged and that builds to what happens later on in the night and it's a good turn for him. We're finally starting the first building block towards him being a serious, more heavyweight contender. I feel like WWE have decided let's go for the slow burn. And let's see how well we can do with this. And to be fair, it was received well. It got mega heat from the crowd, not to mention what happened later in the evening as well. I feel like we're on the right track finally with a guy who has kind of felt like a bitch. And it's really funny because one week ago, we're all saying, including myself, <laughs> Austin Perry, go fuck yourself, buried to shit. Now, all of a sudden, everyone's talking about, oh, Austin Ferry, this is a different look. This is a different individual. He seems to have snapped. He's got a different mentality. And now we're thinking, hmm... What's he going to be like in a few months' time? Let's see, at the turn of the year, what Austin Fury's up to. Wouldn't surprise me if it leads to maybe a Royal Rumble run, potentially winning the Rumble, or maybe they might make it a slower burn, winning the Rumble the year after that. Either way, it looks like they're onto a good thing if they continue down this track. Baron Corbin beat Akira Tozawa, and, and, and I don't give a fucking shit. I really don't. Uh, I like Akira Tozawa. Don't care about Baron Corbin, although he can be a decent heel. Hate JBL. They're backstage playing poker as well. Whatever, man. Nobody gives a shit. Just quickly, in terms of war games, Mia Yim aligns herself with Bianca Belair's team. Shock horror there. And then Rhea Ripley, oh, frankly, rather anticlimactic, just walks up to damage control backstage and goes, Oi, I'll join you because I don't like Mia Yim. And they're like, cool. Thanks for coming, I guess. Great build up for that one. Okay. Main event of the evening, Seth Rollins defends the United States Championship against Finn Balor. And obviously, along with Austin Fury versus Dolph Ziggler, this is easily the best wrestling match of the night. To be fair, there were three really good wrestling matches. We had the match with Chad Gable and Matt Riddle. We had Austin Fury and Dolph Ziggler. And then we had this match, the main event between Finn Balor and Seth Rollins. And they built to the history of it. And they spoke about the fact there's unfinished business because it's Seth Rollins who, you know, injured Finn Balor in the first ever Universal Championship match back at SummerSlam in 2016, 15. I'm sure some sweaty Mark will correct me on that. I don't really care. But the bottom line is they built the history well and the match was fantastic, but you knew there was going to be shenanigans. The OC got involved. Then an all-out brawl ensues. Seth Rollins in the mayhem retains his championship against Finn Balor. But then the real coup de grace of this whole thing is the fact that Austin Fury comes down and beats the shit out of him. And of course, it looks like we're building towards Austin Fury regaining the United States Championship at some point. And Seth Rollins, fantastic as always. Definitely feeling like one of the big stars on Raw. However, there's a real mix-up here. Is he a heel? Is he a face? He comes out. He, you know, admires the crowd for chanting for him. But then as well, he's singing shoosh to his theme tune with the heels, Chad Gable and Otis. And it's like, I like it. I don't mind a tweener, but for an average casual audience, pick a lane and stink with it. But that shouldn't take away from the fact that the ending of Raw with Austin Fury standing over Seth Rollins with the United States title is a good look. Ultimately, though, I thought Raw was a bit boring, to be honest. It was one of these things where they had three great wrestling matches and then they tried to fill a load of crap in between. And again, same complaint. You're going to hear it every week. So if you don't like it, probably best you don't watch. Stop with the three-hour roars. Go back to two hours. You could have had three great wrestling matches, two or three excellent angles built on a Survivor Series, and it would have been absolutely fantastic. A really good, solid roar. Three and a half, four-star roar. Instead, it ends up being two, two and a half. Not because it's a bad roar. It's just too long, and they're fitting in too much, and there's so much stuff that you don't care about. And that's fine, but ultimately, for us... 
the fans who are more, shall we say, hardcore fans who want to see the really good stuff, like Seth Rollins and Austin Theory and Bobby Lashley, you've got to watch the whole thing to see the bits you like. And I know a lot of people will argue, it's three hours. You've got to give them a little bit of everything. That's fine. But I don't know, do I? That's why it's better to watch this in retrospect instead of live, because you can't cherry pick and watch the things you like as much. And that's what makes it a more difficult watch. Either way, Raw, not too bad, not the best. Building towards Survivor Series just felt like a middle of the road stepping stone towards the next premium live event. However, that being said, I hope you've enjoyed this Raw review. I've been Aaron X. Thank you for watching. And we'll catch you very soon for more content from the WrestleBlog.